Now, I should probably introduce Charles. He's an independent scholar in Baha'i history, uh, got a degree, interestingly enough, in applied physics and electroacoustics, but his minor in religious studies and Middle Eastern history became his real passion when he's not earning a living, of course, and supporting his family. Uh, he has been very interested in researching and translating the tablets of Baha'u'llah now for over 30 years and has done quite a lot of work on translation, including occasional some uh, work advising uh, the World Center on their translations and sometimes assisting in various ways. He's a published author and lecturer, and uh, he has offered, I believe, three previous courses for the Wilman Institute, perhaps four. I know he did one on the Lohe Sultan, the tablet to the uh, Shah of Iran, and he did one on the Bayan, and um, I think probably one or two others, but I'd have to go look them up now because it's been some time. We're now beginning, as I said, this additional course on these three tablets, the Surayi Rais, the Lohi Rais, and the Lohi Fawad. These are all part of Baha'u'llah's uh, uh, epistles to the kings and rulers. So without further uh, ado, because uh, we have a lot of slides to cover today, I welcome Sharoch to our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us and offering us this program, and we're looking forward to seeing it. Friends, uh, hello. It's so good to be here again with you, some of you who have uh, been with me through uh, uh, other Wilmet Institute courses, particularly the ones on the proclamatory works of Baha'u'llah, Surah Muluk, Lohe Sultan. And this is a continuation of those uh, tablets. The, the hope is that we shall cover all of Baha'u'llah's uh, proclamatory works and proclamations. And um, um, here today, uh, it's going to be the first of four webinars with this course uh, on the study of uh, these three uh, specific tablets addressed to two Turkish prime ministers, uh, one being Ali Pasha, the other one being Fuad Pasha, even though these tablets uh, with the exception of one of them, were revealed in honor of other individuals, but uh, these two individuals were addressed within the text of these tablets. Uh, but the first and the foremost, and, and doing that in, uh, in a chronological order based on the period uh, during which they were composed, uh, we shall begin with Surah Rais uh, and um, this is the first of two tablets that Baha'u'llah addresses the Turkish Prime Minister Ali Pasha. And today we're going to cover the, uh, the first 15 paragraphs of this tablet. This is the lengthiest of the three tablets that we're going to be covering. Uh, so there's a lot of material in this, and uh, um, I will begin to take us through it. At the onset of uh, all the presentations, I like to ask this question, why is it important to study Baha'u'llah Surah Rais in 2020? Um, perhaps it is very for, you know, important, I was gonna say fortuitous, but I think it's rather more important, uh, especially as we are in the grip of a worldwide pandemic and, uh, and how you may ask, is this related to Surah Rais? Well, uh, let's see how Baha'u'llah himself uh, talks about this, uh, this very special tablet. In one of his tablets, which has been translated into English by Shoghi Effendi in the gleanings from the writings of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah declares this excerpt referring to Surah Rais. He writes, witness how the world is being afflicted with a fresh calamity every day. Its tribulation is continually deepening. From the moment the Surah Rais was revealed until the present day, neither hath the world been tranquilized, nor have the hearts of its people been at rest. At one time, it hath been agitated by contentions and disputes. At another, it hath been convulsed by wars 
and fallen a victim to inveterate diseases. Its sickness is approaching the stage of utter hopelessness in as much as the true physician is debarred from administering the remedy whilst unskilled practitioners are regarded with favor and are ac accorded full freedom to act. The dust of sedition hath clouded the hearts of men and blinded their eyes. Ere long, they will perceive the consequences of what their hands have wrought in the day of God. Thus warneth you, he who is the all-informed, as bidden by one who is the most powerful, the Almighty. So this is an excerpt from uh, this passage that Shoghi Effendi translated from this tablet in um, section uh, 16 of the gleanings from from the writers of Baha'u'llah. So uh, there is lots to ponder on this passage. And, you know, it's very interesting that Baha'u'llah singles out this particular tablet. He could have, there were many other tablets that he had revealed, but here he singles out this tablet. So hence the content of this tablet must be uh, something special and extraordinary because it started something, you know, based on what um, uh, Baha'u'llah uses it as the point of demarcation from since its revelation, the world has not been the same. So what did Baha'u'llah proclaim in this tablet that changed the destiny of humanity? So the, the, one of the things that I want to underscore is that these three tablets that have been revealed by Baha'u'llah, even though they're addressed to these Turkish officials and not all of them, uh, the sections of the tablet are addressed to them, as you will see, for example, in the Surah Rais, only the first eight paragraphs out of 40 paragraphs of it is only addressed to Ali Pasha. So even though the name, so the, ma the name could be somewhat misleading. And even though, for example, there is actually no name given to this tablet by Baha'u'llah, the fact that Baha'u'llah refers in the first sentence to this figure, Ra'is, he does not mention Ali Pasha by his name. He refers to him as the chief or as Ra'is. And uh, Baha'u'llah later on in his other tablets has identified who this Rais is. Uh, Abdul Baha has also done it, and beloved guardian Shoghi Effendi have also emphasized that this this uh, Rais is meant Ali Pasha, who is one of the uh, the most prominent and well known Turkish prime ministers uh, during the Tanzimat period of uh, modern Turkey in the 19th century. And I'll, I'll talk uh, about him uh, a little bit more about a bit of his biography as well. In fact, for those of you who have taken uh, or have, have uh, seen the video uh, that has been posted on Suratul Muluk or the Baha'u'llah's letters to the kings, his general letter to the king, which was revealed in 1866 while he was still um, exiled to the city of Edirne, um, Baha'u'llah does collectively uh, address these uh, Turkish officials, including Ali Pasha and Fuad Pasha. And I have uh, given a short biography of these two very prominent uh, Tanzimat period uh, officials. So moving on to the actual text of the tablet and the uh, circumstances um, surrounding it. The first thing we want to look at is the external features of the Surah Rais. So Surah Rais, which, is, which literally means the chapter of the chief, was revealed entirely in, 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 in the Arabic language. And, uh, and, and to distinguish this, because there, there's actually two tablets that have the title Rais, um, because they're, they're addressed by Baha'u'llah, 
the, the first one that today we're going to be studying is entirely in Arabic. The second one, which was revealed soon after Baha'u'llah's arrival in Akka, uh, in fact, is in Persian. So that one is referred to as Lohirais, and this one that's in Arabic is referred to as Surairais. Although the title does not appear in the text of the tablet, like some of the other works of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah does refer to it by this name in his other writings. You know, there are, I have mentioned this again in, uh, uh, in my other um, seminars and courses, uh, but it's worth uh, mentioning it again, that uh, in some of his writings, Baha'u'llah chooses to entitle uh, or to name his works. For example, he says, Haza uh, Surat al Qamis. Verily, this is the Surah of the Garment. Or Haza Medina to Sab. Verily, this is the City of Patience. So he entitles that uh, work, and that work comes to be known by its title. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, there are those works that are not um, uh, entitled because, as you can imagine, there, there's an ocean of Baha'u'llah's revelation. In fact, uh, the, you know, the last count, uh, there has been uh, over 18,000 tablets cataloged at the Baha'i World Center archives uh, that have been attributed to Baha'u'llah. So it's a, it's a vast ocean. Uh, uh, so it is very important to be able to identify them, to name them. Many of them are nameless, uh, but the, some of the more uh, significant or lengthier or major works of his are, uh, have, have a name. Or if, if they don't have a name like this one, uh, of officially, meaning official by the author uh, himself, there is... Uh, a notoriety that has gone along with it based on the name of the recipient or the circumstance surrounding it or the occasion where the tablet has been revealed, where that sort of name is then designated to that particular work. Um, this tablet uh, is, is not entirely proclamatory. Uh, I have again spoken about the style and the tone of proclamatory tablets of Baha'u'llah, uh, which are generally in Arabic and have this very exalted and, and direct and very eloquent and challenging uh, theme and tone. Um, you, we will see that there are sections of the tablet are have that, that, that uh, style but not all of the, 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 the tablet in its entirety, because the part that particularly Baha'u'llah is addressing the recipient, the actual recipient of the tablet, it, it's a lot more um, meeker, it's a lot more gentler, even though it's in Arabic, it, it's, it's, it's more uh, subdued, it's, it's not in an elevated Arabic and it's not in an elevated tone where Baha'u'llah is actually proclaiming his message, but you will see that uh, through even the translation that we have. Now we have the, uh, the, the privilege of having the entire tablet in full English authorized Baha'i translation, which was uh, proffered to us by the Universal House of Justice in the volume Summons of the Lord of Hosts. It's on page 141, and it's also online as well. So this, all these three tablets that we're going to be studying in the course, they all have been uh, translated in their entirety uh, by uh, the Universal House of Justice. Sections of these tablets, as, as I will refer to, had been translated by Shoghi Effendi, very small sections of, of these particular three uh, that have been, had been translated uh, by the beloved guardian. Um, but uh, majority of it had to be uh, translated and, um, and authenticated and authorized by the House of Justice which was published in the early 2000, I believe 2002 was the first uh, publication of the summons of the Lord of Hosts. Uh, 
So the tablet was composed in honor of one of Baha'u'llah's faithful followers by the name of Haji Muhammad Ismail Kashani, who Baha'u'llah entitled Zabi, which means, or in Arabic, Dabi, uh, an Anis uh, or companion. Worth mentioning um, a little bit about this, uh, this gentleman, uh, one of Baha'u'llah's faithful followers. Uh, in fact, his uh, brother, you would, you would know in the Dawnbreakers, that the, the family was from the city of Kashan. Uh, his uh, eldest brother, Hajmir Zajani, who's known as Hajmir Zajani, a Patapal, was one of the, well, in fact, was the first believer in Kashan who uh, embraced the cause of the Bab. And His Holiness the Bab stayed at his house, I believe, a few nights, three nights or so, uh, during his sojourn uh, in uh, Kashan on the way to Tehran, where he was later diverted and was banished to Azerbaijan. Uh, but during his uh, uh, trip from Isfahan to Kashan, uh, heading to to Tehran, uh, the Bob uh, stayed at the house of the brother of the older brother of uh, Haji Muhammad Ismail Kashani, and it was during that time that also Haji Muhammad Ismail, uh, you know, met the Bob as well, and also was uh, was converted, if you will, or or fell in love with the Bob and embraced the cause of the Bob as well. Um, as I had said earlier, uh, the title of the tablet is derived from its initial addressee, Ali Pasha, the Ottoman prime minister, who's referred to as Rais, which translates into English as the chief. Baha'u'llah penned this awe-inspiring epistle sometime between August 12th and August 17th um, during a short stop in the Turkish town of Kashane on the way to the port city of Gallipoli. Um, some of you may have studied this, and I will re refer to this again in a um, uh, little in, 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 in subsequent slides. Um, uh, the, about the circumstances surrounding Baha'u'llah's banishment um, in, um, from Edirna to Akka. But essentially when Baha'u'llah left, uh, was expelled uh, from Edirna, he was escorted, he had an escort, a government escort, that basically took him to the port city of Gallipoli, uh, where he then uh, embarked on this uh, Austrian Lloyd steamer that took him from Gallipoli uh, eventually to Alexandria and Port Said and Alexandria in Egypt. And from there, they, they um, switched uh, ship again. And from there, uh, from Egypt, basically, they embarked to uh, Port of Haifa, uh, uh, and then to 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 Akka for for his uh, perpetual banishment, which had been uh, issued an edict by the Sultan um, to for Baha'u'llah and his family. Uh, so this tablet we know from Baha'i history and and uh, primary documents left by eyewitness accounts, uh, some of the companions of Baha'u'llah, particularly. And there are references in the writings of also Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha to the circumstances surrounding the revelation of this tablet as well. So um, within a few days of Baha'u'llah leaving uh, Edirna, he arrives in this uh, small town just outside, a few a couple of days, or, or you know, maybe a day or so um, before reaching the port of Gallipoli, the, the sort of the, the, the main destination before they would be embarking, embarking on their sea journey. And uh, so it's sometime between August 12th and 17th. Now, there is some evidence that the tablet may have been partially re revealed 
in uh, the city, in in this town of Kashane, and the remaining sections of it, particularly the section addressed to um, Hajj Muhammad Ismail Kashani, uh, was revealed in the port of Gallipoli, and then the tablet was given to him. Uh, the sort of the original uh, transcribed version of it, or the sort of the primary copy, was given to him. Uh, now, the, the, the story, just to just give you a little bit about um, how this, uh, let me see where we're, um, so at the time of, as I said, of the revelation of this tablet, Baha'u'llah and his family were being deported from the city of Edirne to the penal colony of Akka, situated then in the Ottoman Turkish province of Palestine. And as we shall see, when we study the text of this tablet, Baha'u'llah's pronouncement to Ali Pasha is highly stern and condemnatory because of, uh, you know, because of the expulsion and Baha'u'llah holds him uh, responsible, partially responsible. There's other p individuals who, who colluded, which he says he, that colluded to bring about Baha'u'llah's uh, banishment. Now, going back to the tablet, uh, just to give you a little bit of the timeline, um, Hajj Muhammad Ismail Kashani uh, had attained the presence of Baha'u'llah uh, in Baghdad and um, was on his way uh, to visit, uh, to attain the presence of Baha'u'llah in Edirne when the storm broke and where, you know, where Baha'u'llah uh, became under house arrest the last few days before his expulsion. So essentially, when the order for Baha'u'llah's expulsion came, um, you know, officials and members of the, uh, the government, uh, soldiers, if you will, surrounded the house of Baha'u'llah and would not allow anyone to leave or anyone to come in. And Baha'u'llah makes reference to this in the text of this tablet. So... Uh, Hajj Muhammad Ismail was on his way, you know, not knowing what was going. He was just going to come for pilgrimage to attain the presence of Baha'u'llah. So when he arrives there, he sees uh, the circumstance is very dire. No one can attain the presence of Baha'u'llah and his beloved is going to be uh, banished any day. So he was, him and his, you know, he was, he was with uh, two other individuals at the time. Uh, he was deeply distressed by this, and uh, and when Baha'u'llah is uh, apprised of this, uh, then he orders uh, Hajj Ismail to leave Ederna and go to the port of Gallipoli, uh, and so that he could attain the presence of Baha'u'llah there. So Baha'u'llah gives him some some. Um, sliver of hope, if you will, you know, uh, that, that there is a possibility that he could still, before he's, he's ultimately banished to Akka, that he could attain the presence of his beloved. Um, so, so him, uh, so Hajj Ismail and uh, his, his uh, two traveling companions uh, reach Gallipoli and Baha'u'llah comes to eventually to Gallipoli and uh, he meets with uh, uh, Hajj Muhammad Ismail uh, in a public bath. Obviously, he was still being uh, monitored and there were, uh, uh, you know, soldiers escorting him, making sure that, uh, you know, that, that Baha'u'llah and, and his family do not escape because this is now a government edict, essentially uh, banishing him. Um, to this penal colony, making sure that they are. And then there's a group of companions that are basically, uh, they, they uproot themselves and they follow. And at first the, the officials don't allow this to happen, uh, you know, but some of these individuals, uh, you know, decide to, to continue to travel with Baha'u'llah. And when they get to the port, at that point, the government says, well, at this point, uh, this is not a free ride. Uh, we are only, this, this is for the, for the people who are in the edict, essentially Baha'u'llah and his family. Um, so anyone else, 
we're not going to accommodate you. Uh, even if you want to come, you have to buy your own ticket. And, and to, to everyone's surprise, official surprise, you know, some of the companions who were not necessarily um, had, had been uh, subject of the edict, uh, like people uh, that were in the household, but they were not part of the family, uh, they literally buy their own tickets and decide to, to go along with their beloved. And this kind of shocked the, uh, the officials that who in their right mind would actually spend money to actually go on to exile, to a place that is a penal colony that is the worst of the worst places. So they were absolutely dumbfounded by this, uh, uh, as, as some of the um, chronicles of the early believers who were eyewitnesses to this. So uh, Hajj Mirza Ismail attains the presence of Baha'u'llah. He apparently had some questions uh, from the Blessed Beauty that you know he, he, he puts forward. And then Baha'u'llah, as we will see in the tablet, uh, answers his questions. And one of those questions, uh, one of the topics was about the soul, uh, which is very interesting. I always say that Baha'u'llah talks about the nature of the soul in the Surah Rais. And a lot of people say, what? You know, I mean, I say, yeah, it's, 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 it's a magnificent explanation and commentary by Baha'u'llah, which is in the Surah Rais, which we will, we will uh, uh, cover uh, during the course of our studies. So uh, here, Hajj Mirza Ismail attains to his, uh, to his desire, even though for such a short time and in, in, under very unusual circumstances. But according to Aurazeq um, Anad, uh, one of Baha'u'llah's companions who was, you know, uh, in exile with him, and has left a, an account of Baha'u'llah's travels and, and uh, ex uh, banishments, successive banishments. He had been with Baha'u'llah since Baghdad and, and essentially uh, to, to all the way to Akka. He says that uh, at, at the time of departure, um, uh, Hajj Mirza Ismail uh, was very teary and was uh, seeing the blessed beauty, Baha'u'llah, uh, leave the, the key, the dock. So Baha'u'llah gets into this small uh, uh, paddle boat to get them to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the steamer. I guess the steamer was, was, was anchored uh, a few yards away from the actual port. So this is how they, you know, they, they, they left the dock and at the dock, bidding goodbye to his beloved was Hajj Mirza Ismail and his companions there. So that's kind of the, the, the background about the recipient and about the, the history surrounding this tablet. At that time, who would have received the tablet? The tablet was transcribed uh, in the handwriting of Mirza Agha John. Uh, Baha'u'llah's amanuensis of revelation because there's a tablet in which Baha'u'llah actually does make reference to that, that he received this tablet uh, or this tablet was received by, by Zabi. All right, moving on now to uh, the references. Um, making reference to this tablet in God Passes By, Shoghi Effendi writes, to Ali Pasha, the Grand Vizier, Baha'u'llah addressed the Surah Rais. In this, he bids him, quote, hearken to the voice of God, declares that neither his grunting nor the barking of those around him nor the hosts of the world can withhold the Almighty from achieving his purpose. Accuses him, accuses Ali Pasha, of having perpetrated that which has caused the apostle of God, Muhammad, to lament in the most sublime paradise. Wow, we will see that in the text of this tablet, particularly. And having conspired with the Persian ambassador to harm him. Mirza Hussein Khan Moshir Abdole, we will make reference to him again a little later. Uh, forecast the, the manifest loss in which he would soon find himself, glorifies the day of his own revelation, 
prophesizes that this revelation will ere long encompass the earth and all that dwell therein, and that the land of mystery, a, a title given to Eterna or Adrianople by Baha'u'llah, and what is beside it shall pass out of the hands of the king and commotions shall appear and the voice of lamentation shall be raised and the evidences of mischief shall be revealed on all sides. Wow. And, and this is a prophecy that came true historically and not, not uh, too long after that, within a few years. Um, and I will get into that from a historical point of view of what happened. So Baha'u'llah's prophecy that the land of mystery that will pass away from the Ottoman rule and that there will be commotion, there will be lamentation, did come to pass. He also, uh, the Guardian says, uh, identifies that same revelation with the revelations of Moses and Jesus, recalls the arrogance of the Persian emperor in the days of Muhammad, the transgression of Pharaoh in the days of Moses, and of the impiety of King Nimrod in the days of Abraham, and proclaims his purpose to quicken the world and unite all its peoples. And this is uh, an excerpt from God Passes By, page 174. So when studying any of the major summons of Baha'u'llah, I believe three key facets relating to that work needs to be examined. One, the personality and character of the recipient of the tablet, whether it's a king, whether it's a minister, uh, it's very important because it gives context to what the tablet is, uh, is about. Second, the manner in which the tablet was dispatched to this recipient and how it was received, okay? We'll talk about this again. And then thirdly, uh, all the features within the text of the tablet which underscores the, the, the primary theme as well as some of the subjects that are covered in the tablet. You know, um, as, as you will see, and as, as, as God has demonstrated, particularly in the Kitab i Akadas, the style of some of these tablets, they're not conventional. It's not just one theme. Uh, you know, Baha'u'llah could be talking about one subject and then, you know, you'll see in the next paragraph, he's talking about something completely different. And this is, the, this is the style of this revelation, which is magnificent. You know, Baha'u'llah talks about the Aqdas has been revealed in a manner that amazeth the minds of mankind. <laughs> and believe me, it has amazed the minds of many, uh, many people, including yours truly as well. When you, when you, you, know, when you study it, it, you know, just from one, one subject to another subject, completely different. So, so uh, there are these these layers, there are these uh, um, very unique style of, of the revelation and the presentation, if you will, of the tablet and the, and, and the topics within the tablet. All right, uh, let's uh, briefly talk about uh, Ali Pasha. His name was Muhammad Amin Ali Pasha. Ali means exalted. So he had become known as Ali Pasha. His name was Muhammad Amin. You know, uh, Muhammad Amin, so he's, he's also known as Muhammad Amin Ali Pasha, uh, held the office of the Grand Vizier five times uh, between 1852 and 1871. He was one of those individuals uh, that came through the Office of Translation. Uh, he spoke fluent French and also spoke English. So this, at that time, during the modernization of uh, Turkey in, in the early 19th century under Sultan Mahmud, um, uh, who's considered to be like Peter the Great of, uh, of the Ottomans, um, was, was very significant. And so um, he worked his way, certainly wasn't a member of the aristocracy or anything like that, but him and his... Uh, um, uh, compatriots uh, who later on uh, worked together during the Tanzimat, which was Fouad Pasha, uh, and they held the office of the uh, premiership uh, and foreign ministership, which were the two very important offices of the government, uh, simultaneously sometimes together, uh, and, and uh, you know, 
and, and one was sometimes a prime minister, the other one was a foreign minister and vice versa. But Ali Pasha himself held the office of the Grand Vizier five times during 1852 to 1871. The first uh, uh, period of his premiership uh, was uh, under the Sultanate of Sultan Abdul Majid, uh, who was the eldest son of Sultan Mahmud. Um, then, uh, after the passing of Sultan Majid in 1861, uh, Sultan Abdul Aziz, the second son of uh, uh, Mahmud, uh, ascended the, the throne, the Ottoman throne. And during that period, he also was, uh, was the premier. At that time, he was a very seasoned premier, him and Fouad. And uh, in fact, his last grand vizirate uh, lasted about four years until his death. So he began uh, his premiership in 1867 uh, to September of 1871 when he died. So he definitely was the prime minister at the time of Baha'u'llah's banishment to uh, Akka in 1868. Um, again, I, I spoke about this. One of the chief political figures of the Tanzimat, I've spoken about what the Tanzimat or the reforms, the Ottoman reforms or mo modernization um, was. And he was one of the, he's considered to be the one of the architects of the Tanzimat. Now, um, Ali Pasha was formally addressed by Baha'u'llah four times, in fact, twice collectively and twice personally. Uh, the first collective uh, summon was in a tablet that was revealed uh, uh, at the time of Baha'u'llah's banishment from Istanbul, the four months that he was uh, in Istanbul, uh, and then he was banished from Istanbul to Ederna uh, just before uh, his banishment, Baha'u'llah wrote a tablet which is known as Loha Abdul Aziz Vavokala. Unfortunately, we don't have the text of it. Uh, hopefully, it can be found in the Ottoman archives, but not as, a, as of yet. Uh, it could be there, it could have been destroyed. I, you know, we don't know, but we certainly don't have the text of it. Nabil, in his narrative, has talked about uh, the tone of the tablet, and Shoghi Effendi has described some of its contents and the manner in which it was presented to the uh, Ottoman government um, um, in, in his book, God Passes By. Uh, but the, the first major summons collectively was, which we do have, and we have studied in our course uh, on uh, the Baha'u'llah's Surah Muluk, was in the summer of 1866, uh, along with addressing the Ottoman um, high command uh, and other various other individuals, including the Sultan Abdul Aziz himself. Uh, but the, the last two, um, being in August of uh, 1868, Surah Rais, and roughly September, October uh, of 1868 uh, for Loha Rais, and we'll, we'll, we'll be studying Loha Rais as well. In the Surah Rais, Baha'u'llah denounces him. We've already covered these, so I am going to uh, skip over some of these. Um, now, Baha'u'llah accuses, and you will see Ali Pasha conspiring with the Persian ambassador, Mirza Hussein Khan al Mushir al who at that time was the ambassador to the Sublime Port, had been an ambassador, in fact, since 1858. Uh, and uh, he also colluded with not only the prime minister uh, of Turkey, but also with the French uh, ambassador, Marquis de Mostier, who uh, Baha'u'llah makes reference in Surah Al-Muluk to that he basically, they colluded with each other. Uh, Mirza Hussein Khan later on became the, the foreign minister of Nasiruddin Shah and later his, his prime minister. Um, and over the period of time, uh, he changed his view about Baha'u'llah, and Baha'u'llah acknowledges him uh, as having basically, you know, 
uh, reformed his attitude towards him and his uh, faith, uh, but he is forever will be known for um, the his his efforts to banish Baha'u'llah and suppress the Baha'i the the Baha'u'llah and his followers during their exiles in Adirna and and later on in in Akka. Um, Again, we'll, we'll cover Lohar Ais as well, but we'll just skip through this right now um, and because we're, we're gonna be seeing that. Uh, so wanna get to the, the, the text of the tablet. As always, I like to share with you uh, the first couple of lines in the uh, original uh, so you can uh, hear the melodies of how it is uh, revealed. So the tablet begins with Bismil al Abha Ya Rais Isma Nida Allah Hal Malikil Muhaymin al Qayyum in Nahu Yunadia Bain al Arda was Sama Wayad O al Kulla El al Manzar al Abha. So you can see still there's some alliteration the, the, the here um, with, with the um, As Sama. Uh, and Al Baha. So it's Bain al Ardu was Sama, we had U al Khalga Ela Manzar al Abha. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, poetical, if you will. But this is the first line of the, uh, uh, of the tablet. And here I have um, underlined it, the section that I just read to you. In his name, the All Glorious, hearken, O Chief, to the voice of God the sovereign, the help in peril, the self-subsisting. He verily calleth aloud between heaven and earth, summoning all mankind unto the scene of transcendent glory. Neither thy grunting nor the barking of those around thee nor the opposition of the hosts of the world can withhold the Almighty from achieving his purpose. The whole world hath been set ablaze by the word of thy Lord, the all-glorious, a word softer than the morning breeze. It hath been manifested in the form of the human temple, and through it God hath quickened the souls of the sincere amongst his servants. Now, this last sentence here, uh, it hath been manifested in the the form of the human temple. It's worth reflecting on, especially in comparison to, to the statement in the Gospel of John and the Gospels about the Word being with God and the Word being made into flesh. Here is a, is a parallel reference here that uh, Baha'u'llah says this, it, the Word has been manifested in the form of a human temple and through it God had quickened the souls of the sincere amongst his servants. Um, In its inner essence, this word is the living water by which God hath purified the hearts of such as have turned unto him and forgotten every other mention and through which he draweth them nigh unto the seat of his mighty name. We have sprinkled it upon the people of the graves and lo, they have risen up with their gaze fixed upon the shining and resplendent beauty of their Lord. This last sentence, again, it's a uh, a prophetic and a prophecy fulfilled, a reference to resurrection, both in Islam and Christianity, that the day of judgment, the day of resurrection, and where he says that we have sprinkled it, these word, upon the peoples of the graves, those people who are basically dead, and lo, they have risen up, with their gaze fixed upon the shining and resplendent beauty of their Lord. So this could be read in, in, in many ways in fulfilling the prophecies of resurrection, as well as people who are dead, where, where Jesus, if, if you remember uh, when there was a funeral, uh, you know, he says, let the dead bury the dead. So again, the spiritually dead here have been quickened by this new revelation. And people who have been awaiting are also who are in their graves, in their sepulchers, have been also resurrected as well. 
In the second paragraph, more than half of which has been translated by Shoghi Effendi in, in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah castigates the Turkish prime minister for his arrogance and accuses him of colluding with the Persian ambassador at the sublime port, Mirza Hussein Khan al-Mushir al-Dole, to cause him and his followers grief and trouble. He says, thou hast, O chief, committed that which hath caused Muhammad, the apostle of God, to lament in the most sublime paradise. The world hath made thee proud so much so that thou hast turned away from the face through whose brightness the concourse on high hath been illumined. Soon thou shalt find thyself in manifest loss. Thou didst conspire with the Persian ambassador to harm me, though I had come unto you from the source of majesty and grandeur with a revelation that hath solaced the eyes of the favored ones of God. The tone and style of the third paragraph is very similar to that of the other proclamatory tablets of Baha'u'llah during this period, especially the tablets in which he summons the kings and rulers of the world. Just listen to this. And, and for those students who are in the class, uh, we'll be reflecting on this as well. Baha'u'llah writes, by God, this is the day wherein the undying fire crieth out from within in all created things, the best beloved of the world is come. And before all things, there standeth a Moses hearkening to the word of thy Lord, the Almighty, the all knowing. Were, were we to divest ourselves of the mortal raiment which we have worn in consideration of your weakness, all that are in heaven and on earth would offer up their souls for my sake. Wow. To this thy Lord himself doth testify. None, however, can perceive it save those who have detached themselves from all things for love of their Lord, the Almighty, the most powerful. In paragraph four, Baha'u'llah warns Ali Pasha that he will ultimately fail in his attempt to suppress the spread and proliferation of the cause of God which has been set in motion by the will of the Almighty. He writes, has thou imagined thyself capable of extinguishing the fire which God hath kindled in the heart of creation? Nay, by him who is the eternal truth, couldst thou but know it rather on account of what thy hands have wrought, it blazed higher and burned more fiercer. Ere long will it encompass the earth and all that dwell therein. Thus hath it been decreed by God and the powers of earth and heaven are unable to thwart his purpose. In paragraph five, Baha'u'llah continues his reprimand of Ali Pasha and his government. He states that as a punishment, for the injustices committed by the Ottoman government against him and his followers, soon there shall be divine retribution handed down by the hand of the Almighty with severe consequences for the empire. He, he writes, the day is approaching when the land of mystery, Adrianople, and what is beside it shall be changed and shall pass out of the hands of the king and commotions shall appear and the voice of lamentation shall be raised and the evidences of mischief shall be revealed on all sides and confusion shall spread by reason of that which hath befallen these captives at the hands of the hosts of oppression. The course of things shall be altered and conditions shall wax so grievous that the very stands, that the very sands on the desolate hills will moan and the trees on the mountain will weep and blood will flow out of all things. Then wilt thou behold the people in sore distress. Now, now, in the footnote that the House of Justice 
have provided. Um, it says Sultan Abdul Aziz lost both his throne, his throne and his life in 1876. It was a palace coup. I've, I've spoken about this uh, in my um, previous seminar uh, during the subsequent war with Russia. Now this is the this is this is the period where actually uh, Adrianople was was uh, was annexed by Russia. Uh, was uh, during the uh, Turco-Russian uh, War of 1877-1878. Uh, the Tsar at that time, interestingly enough, was Tsar uh, Nikolaevich Alexander II, uh, the, the Tsar that Baha'u'llah also addressed uh, in his letters to the kings as well. Um, and uh, this was a this was a war that was the the the, the Turks were absolutely decimated they were land based they just they they it couldn't they couldn't wait to 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 end this war and uh um there there there's so many events if you if you look at look it up even look at look up in in wikipedia you will you will see the the the, the horrific um way that this war kind of and and the turks lost thousands of people and uh, during that, and it really was a bloodbath. Um, and this is the one that Baha'u'llah is making a reference to. Uh, now, Ali Pasha never lived long enough to see this. this. He died in 1871. The war was 1877, 1878. And even the Sultan did not, you know, he, he died in 1876, but a year after uh, he died, uh, under the new Sultan Abdul Hamid, uh, this war happened. So it was the whole Ottoman Empire was encompassed by this divine retribution, which Baha'u'llah is foreshadowing. Very interesting. In paragraph six and seven, Baha'u'llah alludes to some past events of history, such as Pharaoh's, uh, such as Prophet Muhammad's uh, proclamation to the Sasanian king Khosro Parviz. Uh, who reigned between 590-628, and the opposition shown by the Egyptian pharaoh Ram Ramesses II and the Mesopotamian king Nimrod at the time of Moses and Abraham, respectively. Nimrod was at the time of Abraham. We don't have any historical records. Uh, again, there's a reference made in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, uh, to Nimrod and also in, in, in the Quran and in the Islamic tradition as well. Namrud, as he is known in, uh, in, in Islam and in, uh, in Arabic. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the Pharaoh uh, that was contemporary to Moses, which is very interesting here, uh, is Ramesses II. Um, here was considered to be one of the so the great pharaohs. And then King uh, Khosro Parviz, uh, the, that's, the translation is the Khosro. Khosro Parviz was perhaps one of the last of the great uh, Sasanian kings. He was not a really a good king. He was a conqueror. In fact, uh, Parviz means in the old Persian means victor, um, someone who has, so he is known as Khosro the victor uh, as well. And as you can see, his timeline uh, was uh, Prophet Muhammad passed away in 632. Uh, Khosro Parviz was assassinated in 628. So just uh, um, about four years before the passing of Prophet Muhammad. And Baha'u'llah does make reference to the epistle that Muhammad, uh, as we will see here, sent to Khosro Parviz, which he ignored and kind of threw away. Um, so he... He says, O oh chief, we revealed ourselves unto thee at one time upon Mount Tina and at another time upon Mount Zaita. Now, it's worth uh, taking a moment and explaining this because even the footnote um, in, the, um, um, in the summons of the Lord of hosts is very brief and does not really get into um, literally Mount, Mountain of Figs or Mount, Mount of Figs and Mount of Olive. So Mount Tina and Mount uh, Zaita. That is also mentioned in the Quran in Surah number 95 in the, the first verse. Now, in a tablet, Abdu'l-Baha, uh, one of the friends had asked 
the beloved master about the meaning of Mount Tina and Mount Zeta. And Abdu'l Baha says, he goes into a wonderful commentary, this tablet has not been translated into English. For those of you who are interested and can read Farsi, I can give you the reference, is in Mahdi Asamani, uh, Volume 2. In that, um, Abdu'l Baha says the reality of Jesus is Mount Tina, and the reality of Muhammad is Mount Zeta. So uh, for the mountain of figs, that's, the, that's a reference, an allusion to the reality of Jesus. And the Mount Olives is the, uh, or Mount Zeta is a reference to the reality of Prophet Muhammad. And then, so Baha'u'llah writes, O chief, we revealed ourselves unto thee at one time upon Mount Tina and at another time upon Mount Zeta. And yet again in this hallowed spot. And these mountains are actually in the Holy Land, okay? Uh, according to Abdul Baha. Following, however, thy corrupt inclinations, thou didst fail to respond and were accounted with the heedless. Consider then and call thou to mind the time when Muhammad came with clear tokens from him who is the almighty, the all-knowing. The people were wont to pelt him with stones from hidden places and in the markets, and they rejected the signs of God, thy Lord and the Lord of thy forefathers. The learned also denied him, as did their followers. And likewise, the kings of the earth, as thou hast heard from the tales of old. Among those kings was Khosro, uh, or Khosro, this, this is a, a more of a uh, more archaic reference to Khosro Parviz, uh, to whom Muhammad sent a blessed epistle summoning him unto God and forbidding him from misbelief. Verily, thy Lord knoweth all things, following the promptings of his evil and corrupt desires, however, Khosro waxed arrogant before God and tore up the tablet. So here Baha'u'llah is actually adding to history. Uh, you know, we, there, there were some, some mythology, no real historical uh, validity of this that, that uh, and in, uh, Mr. Balyuzi in Muhammad and the Course of Islam has beautifully explained all that based on what is available. But here Baha'u'llah sheds light on it. He says that, through his arrogance, uh, he tore up the tablet. He verily is accounted, and Baha'u'llah says that Khosro is verily accounted among the inmates of the nethermost fire for what he did. Wow. Um, next, Baha'u'llah continues with other kings. He says, was it, was it in Pharaoh's power? to stay the hand of God from exercising his sovereignty when he acted wantonly in the land and was of the transgressors from within his own house. And in spite of his will, we brought forth him who conversed with God. So it's a reference to Moses being raised in the household of the Pharaoh, as, as has been mentioned in the, in the Bible as well. Well, able are we to achieve our purpose. Recall, moreover, how Nimrod kindled the fire of impiety that its flames might consume Abraham, the friend of God. We delivered him, however, through the power of truth and seized Nimrod with the fury of our wrath. Say, the oppressor, put to death the beloved. Now, this is, this. so it ends there where, where it begins now, say the oppressor uh, put to death the beloved of the world to quench the light of God among the people and to debar them from the wellspring of life eternal in the days of thy Lord, the gracious, the most beloved. This is um, in, in the original, um, edition or, the, or in the first edition of the summons 
for those of you who have it, like the one I have, um, the footnote was was incorrect. It, it said uh, that this was a reference to Muhammad Shah. It's actually a reference to Nasreddin Shah. Okay, and in the in the online version of it, the the house have now corrected that. It says the Shah of Iran, but uh, because here it's it's not known who it is, but the one who was responsible for the execution and the martyrdom of the Bab is without a shadow of a doubt uh, was Nasreddin Shah because it was he was the king. It was a young king at the time. He was about twenty years old at the time. But it was his prime minister, Mirza Tarikhane Amir Kabir, that finally, you know, put the order, but you know, to, of the execution of the Bob. But the blessings had to come from the king. I mean, Mirza Tarikhane would not have acted on his own. He would have had to got the blessings of the Shah, which he did. And uh, and here, the the reference, the oppressor here, for those of you who are interested in the in the Arabic text. Uh, is Malik al-Ajam that's, uh, that's re- referring to. The Malik al-Ajam, the word Ajam is a, uh, is a reference, is a euphemism that is used uh, to denote non-Arab. Ajam and Arab. So Arab is Arab. So the Arabs used to refer to basically anyone who was non-Arab as Ajam. But largely... Because the, the greater kingdom, who was at that time, in the time of Muhammad, that was of significance, was Iran, was the Persian Empire. So they would refer to them as the Ajami or the Ajam. Okay? And here, here Baha'u'llah refers to Malik al-Ajam. So Malik al-Ajam here is uh, the king of Iran. And uh, the king of Iran who uh, put to death, was responsible to put to death the beloved of the world, um, was... So here, here Baha'u'llah is continuing, and he says, you know, the, the king of Iran trying to put the beloved of the world to, to, to death, and he did, uh, so that he would quench the light of God, uh, but that he failed to do that because his revelation is, has continued. Now, Baha'u'llah ends his summons to Ali Pasha at the end of paragraph eight. Um, so these first eight paragraphs of the Surah Rais could very well have been revealed while Baha'u'llah sojourned in the town of Kashane on the way to Gallipoli, as I said. Again, this is my theory. Uh, it's not official, but it seems that the tablet did continue sections of it. And it seems that uh, more logical because the questions that was asked, unless he he had sent his questions to Baha'u'llah uh, while Baha'u'llah was in Adrianople. I, it's, it seems very unlikely that he would have done that during this the whole commotion of, of you know people being uh, exiled or or on the verge of being exiled. That that uh, Haji Muhammad Ismail would have asked Baha'u'llah, but it seems more plausible that uh, during his meeting with Baha'u'llah in the public bath, he may have posted, posed rather, these questions to Baha'u'llah, which he had in his heart from the time that he left Iran to come and attain the presence of Baha'u'llah and ask these questions. So it, it very well may have been that he presented it during that time. So the rest of the tablet, it seems, because from, ta- from paragraph nine, he goes on and switches his... his uh, his attention from Ali Pasha to Anis, to his companion, Haji Mirza Ismail. Now, I promised that we were going to go through other paragraphs, but we ran out of time. We will obviously finish this, uh, uh, this, this tablet, uh, hopefully next time, uh, you know, next webinar. For those of you who have joined us here for the public talk, uh, was, I'm delighted that you are here. Uh, for those of you who are considering uh, taking the course, I highly recommend uh, you know uh, joining joining us and studying this together. It's a magnificent. These three tablets are absolutely magnificent, full of very very important subjects and wisdom and guidance and admonishments for 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 everyone, peoples of the world, uh, followers of Baha'u'llah, everyone. And don't let the the titles 
of them being addressed to these uh, monarchs or these uh, government officials uh, dissuade you that it's just just basically Baha'u'llah summons. It's not. It's it's beyond. That's what I've said. It's really divine wisdom beyond these uh, these these uh, addressees that um, that were Ottoman uh, government officials. So at this time, I like to. Uh, end this uh, and then uh, invite Dr. Stockman to come. And if there's any questions, we'll be happy to, uh, uh, to, to answer them and uh, go from there. I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my, uh, my space here, my, my um, okay. So we Thank are- Thank you so much, Cheryl, fascinating. Uh, presentation full of details that I maybe I could have read them somewhere, but I maybe I did it and I've forgotten them. But it's so much that uh, it's really quite amazing. We do have a couple of questions, and I all, I have a few also. But I'll start with the uh, whoops uh, the question that I already have seen. What did I just do? Oh, the chat here. Um, one person asked about the reference to Jesus on the Mount of Olives. I think you were talking about the word made flesh. Was that the Mount of Olives? Uh, no, the Mount Olives, the uh, Mount, th this is, and I, and I knew this was going to kind of confuse some people about the references that Abdul Baha makes to Mount Tina and Mount Zeta. Um, yeah. The reality, uh, it's got nothing to do with Mount Olives. Okay, well, they, well, it has to do with Mount, but not the Mount Olive that Jesus gave his sermon on the Mount. Okay, it's, it has nothing to do with that. It, it basically, what Abdul Baha says, he says that Mount Tina and Mount Zeta, these two mountains, which is one is what is named Mountain of Figs, and the other one is Mountain of Olives. And he says that they are references to Jesus and Muhammad respectively, meaning oh. Mount Tina, the Mount of Figs, Six. is actually Jesus, the reality of Jesus. And then Mount Zeta, or the Olive, is a reference to Muhammad. Hmm. Again, I, that's Abdul Baha. So That's interesting. Very interesting, yes. Yeah, a question, the one person says, thank you for a wonderful um, and amazing presentation. Another asks, was Zabi the first Baha'i in Kaushan? Um, the first Baha'i, oh, Baha'i, okay. Well, the first Baha'i oh, in Kaushan was, was Hajmir Zajani, a Parpo, who became a martyr. And he is in the, in the Dawnbreakers. And uh, I think he's amongst the, the martyrs of Tehran as well. Uh, but, uh, and he's also the author of... Uh, uh, the Noktatul Kaf as well, which was interpolated uh. by, by Mirza Yahya and his followers and so on and so forth. So uh, there, were, there, were, there were essentially four brothers. Uh, three of them we know. The second one is Haj Mirza Muhammad Ismail, uh, which is known as Zabih and Anis. The other third one was actually um, uh, Mirza, Mirza Ahmad Kashani was the third brother who was who was unfortunately uh, notorious. And he's the one who was honored by Baha'u'llah uh, in the revelation of the tablet, the Persian tablet of Ahmad, okay? Which we have excerpts of it in the gleanings, uh, which is a wonderful admonishment of, of, uh, of uh, Baha'u'llah to them. He eventually gets assassinated by his own compatriots in mm -hmm. Baghdad. And, and, and apparently his brother, uh, Mirza Ismail, was not aware that he had thrown his, had thrown his lot in with Azalis. And mm -hmm. he became very upset to hear that. Uh, but again, remember, there was no uh, emails or social media or, or, or even the post was not as readily. So many, you know, they relied on word of mouth. And, and people who would come in, sometimes some of the news that would reach uh, these individuals, it would take months before they would, they would, they would hear of it. Uh, but so, so these are the three brothers that we know that had prominence. As far as, as him being the first Baha'i in Kashan, it could be. I, again, very prominent, very, uh, he is 
amongst the um, early believers. He passed away in 1881, and uh, but we do have a few accounts and many tablets revealed in his honor. Now, we're going to talk about him a lot more in the <laughs> second part because the second uh, or the, 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 the two-thirds of the tablet, if you will, is addressed to him. And we're, I'm going to introduce him a little bit more in more detail and, and share with you some more information about him as well. And the remaining part of the tablet, you said is basically to Zabi. Is there any additional content to Ali Pasha? No, not that I can see. Uh, but it, it, from, the, from the paragraphs, it seems that uh, they're all uh, addressed. <laughs> Uh, but I, we will, we will, we will, we will go over it with a fine tooth comb again. But how uh, many, how many paragraphs altogether? Uh, forty-one, I believe. Yes, forty-one paragraphs. So there's a lot of tablet left. Wow. Yes. Why would he? Why would Baha'u'llah have, shall we say, added a tablet to Ali Pasha, to a tablet to Zebi? Um. This was, you know, you know, the friends were continually uh, asking, supplicating from Baha'u'llah. They would, they would, they would write letters to his secretary uh, and uh, asking, you know, questions, uh, and and there would be a response. There will be always be a response. But oftentimes, it, it coincided with, with God's will to, to express his, let's say, divine wrath or his, uh, um, his uh, displeasure or his pleasure about some other events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it just happened to be, for example, the tablet to Fahd Pasha is, uh, uh, is, is addressed actually, to Sheikh Qasim al-Samandar, another one of Baha'u'llah's yes. uh, companions. So um, it, 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 that was the case. Very rarely, as I said, if there was a, I mean, these, <laughs> let's put it this way. Uh, I guess uh, he did not feel that they deserved a full tablet. Now, in all fairness, he does, Baha'u'llah does reveal an entire tablet addressed to Ali Pasha in the second tablet, after he's he's landed in uh, in the first few weeks of his landing in Akka while he's in the prison, he he describes some of the some of the events of his arrival and some of the the, the real difficulties in that tab tablet, and we're going to study that tablet. Mm -hmm. But but I guess this you know just imagine the circumstance you know Baha'u'llah could not, and again I'm just this is pure conjecture on my part because. He doeth whatsoever he willeth. Uh, you have to imagine, you know, he, he is being hurried out. He is beleaguered. Him and his family are beleaguered. So his Baha'u'llah is not sitting in, in even in, in, in some minimal measure of comfort where and, and he could even dictate tablets, you know. So the circumstances are very fluid here. So he may have wanted to uh, reveal a, a reprimand, as he did, to Ali Pasha and send him. And at the same time, he's receiving uh, questions from Haj Muhammad Ismail, you know, Kashani. So he decides to combine the two. Again, that, that's, uh, that's my theory. But again, God knows his own uh yeah. ways and i as i said so I, I think but this is not unusual this was never an unusual thing um uh, that baha'u'llah did like even with jawahir al-asrar for example the, there was one question that was asked of him baha'u'llah says well as we were going to address this one question we decided to answer many other questions as well <laughs> for for the edification of others so again just the, the this style of baha'u'llah and the way he revealed uh, his his tablets. Was this tablet ever intended to be delivered to Ali Pasha, or did it just simply go to Zabi? Um, 
I don't know whether it actually reached Ali Pasha. Uh, I mean, remember at that time, the circumstances were very fluid and we're talking about days and weeks where Baha'u'llah is in, in, en route, is in exile and, you know, he's, you know, so to try to send this back through the channels, perhaps he could have done that, but he obviously, he felt he needed to write a separate tablet to Ali Pasha after his arrival in Akka, which he did, and that's Lohe Rais. And it's, a, it's, a, it's also a lengthy tablet, not as lengthy as this one, uh, but that one, I believe it is addressed entirely to Ali Pasha because throughout the, um, the recounting of various events, he is directing his words to Ali Pasha. So, so I believe that that one is a tablet exclusive to him. With Fahd Pasha, God was not very pleased with Fahd Pasha, it seems. Not that he was pleased with Ali Pasha, but it, that's a pretty scary tablet because he describes the event of uh, him being in hell. And uh, <laughs> which, which is always blows my mind. We'll get to that one. But that one was revealed in honor of Sheikh Qazim Samandar. And Sheikh Qazim has uh, shared some uh, in his account of a, and his, and his, in his um, chronicles of the faith. He does uh, describe the circumstances surrounding receiving that tablet. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. I'll share that with the class um, when we get to it. <laughs> Why would he write directly to Ali Pasha, the Lohe Rais, in Persian, not in Arabic? Well, that one, yes, it's in Persian. And, uh, you know, he chose to, because, I mean, Ali probably knew Farsi as well. I mean, hmm. obviously he knew Arabic, it was the language, but, but he probably knew Farsi. Uh, I mean, he was a... Uh, multilingual individual. Remember, he started in the in the translation uh, bureau of the Ottomans, but he knew European at least two European languages that we know of French. He was very fluent in French and English, and then um, he uh, he I would say he would probably knew some Farsi. I mean, his mother tongue was Turkish, and you know, right. and Arabic. Everybody knew Arabic because of the Quran and being a Muslim, sure. and you know, so that was the. That was the language. That was a script that they were being used. In. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating that mm -hmm. that Baha'u'llah chooses the second tablet to be in uh, in Persian. But it's a beautiful tablet, and you'll see. It's just the tone is very touching. It's stern but very touching. You know, the second one. This one is very fierce and uh, very condemnatory. In tone. <laughs> one person asks, "Was not one of the brothers?" I guess of Zabi uh, Agajan, Mirza Agajan, Secretary of Baha'u'llah. No. No. Agajan, Mirza Agajan was a Kosh from Kashan, but they were not related to them. No. Good question. Very interesting question. One person here also says sometimes it seems something addressed to one is meant for many. For instance, the Persian tablet of Ahmad to the perfidious Kashani has a paragraph state, starting. Oh, banished and faithful friend, with specific admonitions. Following paragraphs are to are all refer to servants. Uh, yes, I mean, Baha'u'llah did do that. You see it even in the Suratul Muluk, uh, where you know it's it's to the generality of all the kings of the earth. But there is about something like. Uh, 15 or 16 recipients in that tablet, which I have outlined uh, for those who are interested to go back to the Surah Muluk. Uh, I mean, that's a very lengthy 50 pages long in English, uh, almost a small book. And, um, and yes, they, when Baha'u'llah addresses individuals, and you will see even in this tablet, uh, he will address uh, in fact, the paragraph uh, 15, he addresses the, uh, those companions who chose to come on exile with him. It's a very touching, very moving, uh, you know, uh, uh, apostrophe 
if you will, to uh, to these crazy lovers. I mean, they were absolutely they could not be without their beloved. They say, okay, where 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 is he going? We're we're coming. I mean, it goes to, it goes to the ends of the earth. We will go with him. I mean, and it, it's very very it shows shows the the devotion. And, and many of these individuals are the ones that Abdul Baha later on has recounted some of their, um, you know, their, their stories in the memorials of the faithful. You know, mm-hmm. many of them are, are amongst those companions who just chose to forsake everything and just, just go and be with their beloved. And even though when they were, many of them were debarred uh, or prevented from associating with Baha'u'llah on a regular basis, but just the fact that they were close to him was enough for them, you know? They were just absolutely smitten, you know, and by their beloved. And then it just, it's so special. It's so wonderful to to read their story. Sure, moths to a flame. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. How many of them, were any of them in the most great prison then, or were they just simply managed to get to Akka and then took up space there in the caravanserais and in the um, the mosque well well first of all if you if you follow Baha'i history you will know that upon Baha'u'llah's arrival for the first two and a half three years uh, the gates you know Akka was really a fort fortified city it had right. two gates as you know when you go on pilgrimage you can go and see Akka that there was a there was a sea gate that that ships would dock or where they would come and then there was the land gate the mm-hmm. land gate, what the officials did, they put several of the Azalis, including uh, Sayyid Say, uh, Muhammad Esfahani and Agha Beke Kachkola, the two fierce lieutenants of Mirza Yahya, uh, posted, and they were supposed to make sure that no um, uh, pilgrims, no Baha'is, would come in to come and visit Baha'u'llah. The only one that kind of, you know, managed to get through was Badi, you know, which, uh, which, which, was a, which was a miracle on its own. And it, it, nobody knew him. He was, he was you know, he, he dressed like, a, like an Arab and he was a young man and nobody. So he, he, was not, he was not recognized. And that's how he actually managed to attain the presence of Baha'u'llah. In fact, in one part, Baha'u'llah says we blinded the eyes of the sentinels so he could come to Baha'u'llah. Remember, Baha'u'llah was in solitary confinement in Akka uh, up to, well, he was in the army barracks, as we all know, for those who have gone on pilgrimage, Baha'u'llah was in solitary confinement. And the, the, the edict, the farman of the sultan had been such that he was not allowed to associate with anyone. And in fact, the, the Persian ambassador had sent uh, officials to check on the, them from time to time. For the first few uh, few years, there were people who used to go there on behalf of the Persian government and would check to make sure that the, the, the farman of the sultan was being adhered to, it be, you know, was being exercised. So it was the circumstance in the army barracks uh, were really severe very severe and 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 this is where we also have i mean it was so severe that when when uh the wounded uh purest branch was asked by Baha'u'llah, what is your last wish he says i i just wish that that the gates would open that friends could come and attain your presence because you know they were they have been deprived even people like nabil had been kind of hovering outside of the city. He would pitch his tent outside. And for, you know, for months and years, he just would wander around there. And the pilgrims who would come from Iran, as you remember, they would come from a distance and Baha'u'llah would wave, wave to them from, from the window of his uh, cell. Uh, so you know, the circumstances was really, really difficult. That's why Baha'u'llah says, he says, we called it the most great prison. And, 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 and then he talks about that in the second tablet to, to Ali Pasha about the circumstances of his arrival and what, what is, you know, uh, and it, it's, it's a magnificent tablet as well. 
Well, did Zab, what did Zabi do after he met Baha'u'llah in Gallipoli? Did he go well, to Akka or did he go back no, to... No, he went to... No one, Baha'u'llah, I mean, only the people who went with him, first of all, for the longest time, they didn't even know where, where they just knew that they were going somewhere. Uh, and, and, and eventually um, they were, you know, when, when news got out, uh, and that that he was in the in Akka and he was in prison in Akka, but he he was he was bidden to go back to Iran and he went back to Iran and he taught the faith and you know he was one of the stalwart uh, companions and followers of Baha'u'llah. So he was he, he, his consolation was this Surah Rais. He gave Baha'u'llah gifted him this revelation. So as much as he was heartbroken that his beloved was being exiled. He at least received uh, the, the honor of attaining his presence briefly in the public bath of Gallipoli and to, to receive this tablet from him. So, so the Lord was very gracious yeah. on, 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 on Zabi, yes. Why did they stop in Koshane for seven or eight days? Do we know that? Um, the, the, their destination was Gallipoli. I mean, they wanted to get them out there. So it was just, it was just a rest stop, you know? I mean, remember there's a, there's a whole entourage of, you know, and, you know, on, uh, just imagine it on horse and buggies and, you know, they're just trying to get, uh, there, I think there were ultimately around 80 people, uh, that, that arrived in Akka. Uh, and so, you know, that, that, that's a, that's a large group of people and they got to have, you know, I mean, and then again, it's, it's on horses and they've got, they got their, their suitcases or whatever little that they could bring with them. So they were just, uh, you know, just trying to move them from one place to, uh, to another and just make sure that when they would arrive in Gallipoli, they, there would be a place for them. And also the, the, the ship, the ship was docking and they, they had arranged for the ship to take them right away. And uh, so there was a plan in, you know, um, in motion uh, with this exiles, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very simple thing. It was rather complex and did, did take time. And back then, I mean, everything went, you know, moved very slowly. So, so yes, the destination was Gallipoli from Eterna to Gallipoli, but they were they were basically they were prob they were five stops, you know, apparently. Uh, but Koshane was he was there for uh, I think two or three days there. So um, again, I, I don't know the reason for that. Which language was Baha'u'llah's favorite language? Is that a question that's, from that's the a question <laughs> from the audience? Well. That's a, that's a tough question to ask. I mean, Baha'u'llah, let, let's put it this way. Baha'u'llah has described um, the, and, and you can read this in, in the, um, the second tablet to Manakchi Chisaheb, the, the, the Zoroastrian um, um, high, you know, priest, or he wasn't, I don't believe he was really a priest, but a prominent Zoroastrian, uh, Manakchi Chisaheb, in, in, which has been translated and is published in Tabernacle of Unity. In this, you know, you know the Parsis, he was a Parsi of India. So the Parsis, obviously, you know, they, they loved the Persian language because there was Zoroastrian. And, and he had said, why, why reveal in Arabic? And Baha'u'llah would say that Arabic is a language of eloquence, you know, and God has chosen. So, he, but, but he also said the, that, Persian is, is the language of light and the language uh, of the sweet language. He says, uh, ahla, the sweet language, nura, so the language of light, and, and then refers to Arabic as Lugate Fusha. So, you know, and, and he says in that tablet, because the manifestation of God his mother tongue is Persian, no matter how much you praise that language, it's not enough. So, so you know, um, 
let's put it this way, from a revelation point of view, I mean, the Kitab al-Aqdas and all the, the laws and the proclamations are essentially in Arabic. But all the other tablets, especially the tablets to the, uh, you know, I mean, the Iran, Kitab uh, al-Badi, his will and testament, they're all in Persian. I mean, it's, uh, that's the language I would assume that, you know, Baha'u'llah uh, loved as well. But I don't know whether he made a distinction saying, you know, I believe I love this language more than the other. I think these are the, the, the twin languages, you know, in the same way that we have twin manifestations, the Bab and Baha'u'llah, and their, their reality is the same. So, you know, there's no distinction, uh, you know, and I think that these are two uh, mediums by which um, God revealed his word in this, in this age, and we must love both of them. Uh, Persian is, I mean, I, my mother tongue is Persian. Persian is, is such, a, such a romantic and just very phonic language. Arabic is, is, is a wonderful language. I, I love Arabic too, but it's a very, uh, it's a very guttural, very harsh language. It's yeah. you know, very, you know, but it's it, a it, lot it's of sounds. Really, that's right. That's right. It, it's, 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 it's more, it's less pleasing to the ear. Let's put it that way. I don't want people to say that. I, At least I, the listen, Persians I, ears. <laughs> yes. But, you know, for, for some people, I mean, it's, it's beautiful when you, when you, when you see the recitation, the chanting of the, of, of the Arabic, uh, you know, I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, it moves me, uh, you know, but Persian has, has, has another sweetness to it. It's po poetical and, and so on. So anyways, they're both good. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Uh, there, there are a few other questions here that are not really related to the, uh, um, this Suraya Rais here. Um, one person asked whether, uh, what, what was the language the, the Bob's first book was revealed in? No, it's Arabic. Yeah, Bayoum yeah. al yes. It's, uh, it's in Arabic. Even his early commentaries that uh, our dear friend and great eminent scholar, Dr. Todd Lawson, wrote his doctoral dissertation on the... Uh, Tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah, the, the Surah of the Cow, that he's written a wonderful book about that as well. And I think he's spoken about it at the Wilmette Institute courses as well. Uh, you know, he's one of my favorite speakers, by the way. I love Todd. I think he's, he's a, a very generous and yet very, uh, very learned scholar and great professor of emeritus of uh, Middle Eastern and Islamic culture. And... Uh, Yes, the, the language is Arabic. The Bob's writings, majority of them, uh, I would say, you know, 80, 85 percent of it are in Arabic, uh, with the exception of the Persian Bayan and Dalail sab -e, the Seven Proofs uh, and a few others. Uh, most of the works are, are in Arabic. Um, another question, which I, I don't quite know what to make of, actually, I'm, I'm not sure if this is correct information. Um, one person says, is it logical that Tahare would say that the death of the Bab by 750 rifles would require the blessings of the Shah? I've never heard anything about this. The blessings of the Shah, that Tahare would say that? Yeah, person is asking that question. I don't know if there's anything, I don't know if that's correct information. I, I, don't know. I would have to see, we would have to look at the source of the, uh, of, of that statement by the, um, I, I don't recall anything immediately, not to say that it does not, it may or may not exist. We, we know that uh, Baha'u'llah has made it very clear uh, that Nasser al-Din Shah was responsible, uh, you know, for the, for the execution, for the martyrdom of the Bab. I mean, here he's, um, he's, he's, he calls them, the oppressor, it's really interesting, the translation, Malik al-Ajam means the king of the non-Arab, literally, that's what it means. But the, but the guardian had translated that into the oppressor, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, that's, that's what the House of Justice had. But Baha'u'llah also refers to him as, as I had, you know, uh, mentioned in my course on the tablet to the Shah of Iran, 
and he refers to him as Sayyid al Zalimin, you know, that basically he's the prince of the oppressors. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and, mm-hmm. and because he's, he's a prince of the oppressors, I mean, this is the oppressor. So he's the oppressor. He's the king, but he's, he's a king, but he was also the, 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 the prince of the oppressors. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we have one other question, which is sort of not about the book. About could you perhaps elaborate in some ways about why Mirza Agha John ultimately broke with Baha'u'llah and became a covenant breaker? This is it's not appropriate to address this question. I can uh, mean uh, Mr. Tahir Zadeh in his revelation of Baha'u'llah, uh, both volume one and I think volume four have, and I think Mr. Balyuzi also have made mention of this. Uh, it's really not related to this, and I don't yeah. want to digress from from that. Right. I think yeah, we're better off focusing on the the topic at hand as well. I agree. I think that's pretty much all of the questions. We had a good number of questions directly related to the Surayi Rais today as well, which was very good. Um, so I think we're pretty much finished today with this discussion. Thank you again very much for this fascinating presentation, which we're looking forward to having up on our website and um, of course available to our course. I hope it generates some additional questions within the course. Um, We'll, as of today, move on to unit two, where we're actually beginning our discussion on the Surayi Rais. And Mm -hmm. so thank you very much again, Sharoch. And for everyone else, we will see you again soon, I hope. So thank you everybody. And invite uh, people to to take, to sign up for the course. Yes, indeed. If they go to wilmetinstitute.org, uh, actually, they may have difficulty finding it there, uh, but they can always email us at learn at wilmetinstitute.org, and we'll be able to inform them how to get into the course. Yeah, the, the course is actually under under courses that are being offered uh, right yes. now. Yes, but I, I looked the other day, and it looked to me like it may possibly have dropped off the list because it's already started. It's not supposed to drop off the list okay. until a week after it starts, but we've had some problems with this new website with the software. So it may very okay. well have dropped off the list because it started on Thursday. Okay. But if they email us at learn at wilmetinstitute.org, we'll be able okay. to help them. So sure. that won't be a problem. So thank you everybody for joining us. Mm-hmm.